Duran Premium Cigars, one of the fastest growing boutique cigar companies, provides smokers a portal into the old Cuban tradition of the perfect balance and the lost art of progressive flavor construction. Roberto Palayo Duran began his career in tobacco over two decades ago in Havana, where his reputation grew within Cuban circles. The creation of Duran Premium Cigars has given Roberto the platform to introduce a series of cigars that offer the quality and construction that he perfected while in Cuba. Brands include the ultra-premium Roberto P. Duran Signature Line, Azan, Nea, and Baracoa. Duran uses a seed to humidor approach as all of their tobacco is grown in their farms and rolled in their factory in Esteli, Nicaragua. Rollers have been carefully chosen to carry out Roberto's precise method to ensure progressive flavor in each cigar. Duran Premium Cigars invites you to make their premium your standard. Hey Paul, what's up? What's up, Mark? I right, did you hear about the new cigar that's coming out? Which one is that? There's like 800 new ones every week. The one with the Connecticut Broadleaf wrapper. Oh really? I love Connecticut Broadleaf. Which uh, who makes it? Um, I think it's Nicaraguan. So Nicaraguan binder and filler, or it's made in a factory in Nicaragua? Uh, I always have to Google these, and it's taking me like an hour to find out what it is. If this is a frequent conversation with your cigar buddies, look no further than Stogie Geeks News, the only cigar news podcast on the internet. Will Cooper, the man behind Cigar-Coop.com, and Paul Asadorian from the Stogie Geeks produce a weekly show covering the latest cigar news, new blends, cigar manufacturer announcements, and more. Subscribe to the video version on YouTube or get the audio version in your favorite podcast catcher. Head on over to stogienews.tv to subscribe today. Welcome back to the Stogie Geek Show. This is episode 212, but it's Monday, December 5th, 2016. Will Cooper in Studio C. Uh, we have Mark, Riley, and Tyler at the Villager North America Studios in Rhode Island. Paul's not here tonight. Uh, give, again, give these guys the best production team in the business right now, and we couldn't do it without these guys. So um, give them a big shout out. They, they're just awesome. And we have Aaron Loomis here. Uh, really hey. glad to have Aaron, always like having Aaron. And um, Aaron, I didn't ask you before getting to kind of the hot topic. What were you smoking in the first segment? I apologize, I didn't get into that. I was smoking the uh, Debonair Habano Bellicoso. Oh, I should have. I should have asked that. I didn't know if you had, you know, had any. But I, I, I love his Bellicosos actually. Yeah, it's a fantastic cigar. Uh, I really enjoy yep. all the uh, feel stuff. Yep. And what did you decide to light up? I know we kind of got both got through our cigars. So what did you light up? Yeah, I'm doing a protocol uh, Crone right now. Tell you what, um, you know, we're getting a lot of buzz that cigar. I, I actually yeah. lit up a uh, Intemperance uh, AWS uh, Lonsdale BA. Okay. Uh, nice. So I'm picking. I'm picking some of my favorites tonight uh, for cigars. Uh, so it's been a big cigar day for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I start. I start off with the Davidoff Yamasa actually before before the show. So. Okay. Uh, Can't go wrong with that. Yeah. Yep, no, I, I spoke to Robusto that Paul's, and we'll get into Stogies of the Week, but Paul's been recommending that I smoke that Robusto, and I'll have thoughts about that in the Stogies. I'll actually put that in the Stogies of the Week this week because it was a late entry, but I want to talk about that. Um, you know, so you mentioned Protocol, and they've had a great year. And we start talking, it's December, and it seems like, Aaron, we get together, you and I, on different shows, whether it's, you know, this show some other shows at Dave Burke, Dojo, and it's, it's that time of the year where a, a cigar of the year, we're getting into cigar of the year. Right. And rather than, we've done enough hot topics on the election, and we've done enough hot topics on Cuba. So I want to change it to another hot topic every December, which is cigar of the year. Mm -hmm. And next week is the big, you know, hey, look, cigar aficionado is still the barometer in this industry, and I, I kind of make... Uh, a lot of people, they, you know, I get compliments. Paul and I get compliments on, on our list. But you know what's the funny thing is, Aaron? If I put a manufacturer and gave them slots 1 to 10 for cigar, you know, their cigars for cigar of the year, and if they can get a number 11 from Cigar Aficionado, they trade that 1 to 10 from me in a heartbeat for the number 11. It, it, exactly. it carries a lot of – yeah. So I'm not going to try – I don't try to compete with that. But it does stim – it does bring up – a really interesting topic. And I know you and I have definitely talked about this before, maybe even on some different shows, but it's, it's about what the criteria is for, for a cigar of the year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, so I was originally in the camp that you have to have the cigar that it has to come out during this year. 
Right. And it has to be released during this year. And in fact, my list this year is still going to reflect that. Although I'm changing it. I'm going to be changing it mm-hmm. for the future. Some of it's going to be FDA driven, but Cigar Aficionado, they've gotten criticized a lot for their basically not doing that, that they bring in basically any cigar for that. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was as big a critic of that of anyone from the beginning. But in the last year or so, I've kind of changed my opinion, and I think they may. Ha- I think, I think they may have something to what they're doing. I, there's a few holes with it, but and the reason why I think there's validity, and this is I'm sure going to spark a lot of debate, is there's two things you can account for with cigar aficionado, cigar of the year, vintage of the tobacco, and mm-hmm. aging of the cigar, that you just can't do. And I talk about the. The problem, the dilemma I had last year was when Steve Saka's Sober Mesa came out. I think it would have been higher had that cigar come out not in November, which was it was still very good in November. But if that cigar had come out in May, I think I would have saw that cigar. It was like num- it was in. I think it was like number twenty three on my list. It probably would have made the top fifteen if, if that was mm-hmm. the case. Because I know, how, but it didn't. So I want to kind of get your. What are your thoughts on that? You know that argument. Um, I think I'm still in the camp of not liking the cigar aficionado list. And I know you're kind of moving, going to be moving more towards that. Um, so I think you have a, a big road ahead of you to take that on. And my biggest, cr- I have a couple criticisms of it. One is just the name cigar of the year lends itself to being the year. So however you want to define it, um, I think that, you know, if the people that take it literally, that's where they kind of go off the rails for the way they're, they're doing it. Um, I do think it's, you know, it, there's, there's room for a list of, you know, any cigar that somebody smokes within a time frame. Um, I just say come up with a different name for it. Um, the second thing I have an issue with is you have such a portfolio of cigars that you, that you could include in that list, and you can't smoke them all in that year. Um, if you're just kind of saying everything that's available right now is eligible, you have so many lines, and then you have so many Vitolas in those lines. You, you know, we have a hard enough time smoking everything that came out in the year. You know, we have to just make decisions what we're going to focus on because we can't do them all. At least I can't do them all. Um, and I think when you just have everything available to you, um, your chance of covering enough to make a really inclusive list is, you know, near impossible. So those, those are my biggest criticisms to the way that system works. It's completely valid. It's a valid criticism, no doubt about it. But um, the thing, so, but you know, again, when I look at what Cigar Aficionado does, they they're in this. They have that same problem. I mean, it's a smaller. It's a small team. They don't have this like a hundred person group going right. through every cigar either. So, I think I think it kind of. I think it's going to kind of change. You know, I think when we get into. Um, FDA, and if it if it is a worst case scenario, I think it. I think if people are going to want to do their cigar of the year list, they're going to have to change. There's there's no yeah. way around it, um, because I you know. So I think it's it's kind of like if you look at marathon running, they actually call the world record the world best, mm-hmm. because someone running the marathon in Rotterdam. Versus someone running a marathon in San Francisco, you know, it, it's it's two different things. So yeah, you know, so I think that's where. So I kind of think it's eventually going to evolve with me. What is the best cigar we covered during the year? Sure. I don't think I don't. But I go back, Aaron, and I'm gonna kind of debate this a little with you. So when Monte Cristo number two won in 2013, mm-hmm. did you smoke? Did you smoke that cigar at all? Um, I did smoke that cigar, but the problem here is, is that you have, you know, multiple year box codes and different months and different things like that. And you can have one month from a certain factory that smokes really well. Um, and you can have another month from a different factory that doesn't smoke as well. So the problem with CA is if they can't give you the information about which one it is, you're kind of lost because, um, you just go out and buy one you know, or you come across one, you, you don't know that you're matching it up. So you can't really say this is a, a true comparison of, of what their experience was. So, and especially in the non-Cuban world, 
um, the identification is um, almost non-existent for most brands. You know, some brands do do date them, um, but not at the level that Cuba does. So that's a, another real great area that I see in that kind of a inclusion part. Yeah, I'll, actually, I'll plug Phil Zengi. I don't know if I could see it, but you probably can't <laughs> see it. He puts a date on the back of his band when yeah. that cigar was banded. So, yep, okay. Yeah. So in terms of that, um, he does do it, but I would say 90% of the industry doesn't do it. And you know, how, you know, as much as I do getting information from the cigar industry is very difficult. They, this is, right. they don't know, they don't know the answers to these things, but I, I agree with you, um, on that. Now, when I smoked, when I, when I heard that number one, I admit I was a little surprised. I did get some Monte Cristos, which I was told was from a 2013 run. Mm-hmm. And I smoked it against a previous Monte Cristo. And I can tell you, they were, the cigars were consistent. All right? They weren't two different cigars. But I can right. tell you that one from 2013, they, <laughs> they, they got they, – that cigar was – it's just – you know, and I wondered if it was my head. You know, I wonder if it right. was in my head. But, I, I do, but I've talked to enough people that they do feel that that was the case uh, with, with that cigar. Yeah. Yeah, the FDA is throwing a whole wrench into the things. I mean, I think for obviously this year and 2017 and 2018, you probably could, probably could stick with that um, calendar year type of um, ranking. But once you get into how 2018 evolves and then 2019, depending on what actually transpires, there may be a, a quite of a change in how people will probably do their lists. Yeah, but because, you know, what we're going to do is next year it's going to be a two-year window. So there, right. there are cigars that weren't – it has to be rated. So the cigar, or cigars we didn't rate this year. So they're, they're going to be – if they weren't rated, that doesn't, like in the past, they, you lost out. But there was so right. much stuff that was released this year. So next year it's going to be 16 and 17 cigars. And then, like, like after that, Aaron, I'm in the same boat. I got to make a decision. I'm leaning I, – I really want to do it different. I really want to factor in, you know, these, the vintages and the aging. I don't, like I said, but, and that's where I think that's where I have the holes with the aficionado list. If, if I had that information and if they had that information, cause I'm not blaming them for not getting it. I, I believe it's hard to get and truthfully get it because yeah, they buy the cigars. They don't get those for free. So it's hard for a manufacturer to say, Hey, you pick that store, the cigar up at X, Y, Z. I don't know. You know, like I could do it with Phil's cigar. But right. most of them, I, I can't, I can't determine that. So yeah. it becomes an unexact science right now. Yeah. Cause you know, some shops could have slow moving inventory of the cigar that you're looking to do. And, you know, it may be sitting on the shelf for four years and, um, you know, go to another shop and it's, you know, it's only been in there for a month or two. And then you really, you know, it's a disparity between those, those two cigars that you're trying to compare. Yep. No, exactly. So I'll throw a few, I'm going to throw a few random questions just in regards to Cigardia yeah, and just, you could give me your thoughts or, or whatever, but sure. what are your feelings on what I would call Uber limited cigars? I'm not talking something that's something that's a, a very hard limited edition. Should they be eligible for cigar to your list? Uh, I think it's fine to have it in the list. Um, you just kind of have to state your criteria on what it is. You know, if you're, if you're just saying like wide release, regular production, then that just make that your criteria. If you're saying, you know, any cigar released in the year, um, it could be an event only cigar that, you know, you have to go to an event to pick up and, you know, I'm fine with that as long as you're stating kind of what your criteria is. Um, I know some people say, well, you put it on the list, but I had zero chance of ever getting a hold of it. You know, that's fine. But there's, there's lots of lists like that where, you know, it could even be wine. Um, you know, when they when Wine Spectator or Wine Enthusiast does a list, there may be wines that people have no chance of ever getting, but it's still going to make the list the way they do it. So I think I think it's okay. Okay, um, I'm kind of I've changed on that one too a little. I, I kind of basically have now said uh, I look for about the twenty to fifty retailer mark, um, and that's kind of where if it, if it was I have I no longer will include a shop exclusive uh, on my list. Uh, and, and I'll be honest with you, and I'm gonna get, I'm gonna probably get hate mail. It's because of the lack of cooperation I've gotten from most of the retailers on shop exclusives, where I can't give it a fair shot um, if I don't have the information on it. So I'm not gonna. It, it just gets to a point where, and it was just too many of them. So I, I kind of just said, 
I'll put it as an honorable mention or something instead if right. I find something really good. Um, and same with event cigars. But in terms of, yeah, I, I do agree there's something about finding the diamond in the rough cigar that really smoked good this year, too. So I, I have gone down that route in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, stealth cigars. <laughs> for, uh, I'll talk to, for my site, uh, stealth cigars would, won't be eligible. Um, for us, it's going to be something that's a, 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 a regular release. So um, something that's stealth, I'm assuming that they're probably going to actually do a, a more formal um, release um, sometime next year. Um, so that's when we'll include those cigars. Now, the tricky part is defining how the company is going to, Obviously, the company is going to typically say it was released before August 8th in 2016. So you're going to have to play around with you know, how you define that in your criteria. Um, but if one shop got five boxes or whatever it is just to get in under the deadline, it's, it's kind of like those hard to find. It's just it's not something we have access to, so we're not going to include that. But we do want to include it once it actually gets a formal release. Yeah. No, I, I would... Uh... I, I kind of I, I went the same route. In fact, I'm not reviewing stealth. And stealth cigars, just for the audience who doesn't know, it's a term kind of uh, coined to basically mean it was a cigar that was kind of put into the market before August 8th. And if you just heard the segment with Phil Zangi, he talked about the daybreak. Uh, but he was even saying those cigars he felt weren't really ready to do a full production rollout, but he had to get some of them out there. So there's cigars you don't – they're not – I don't think there's a purpose in reviewing those cigars. And they could be really, really good now. And they could really stink later. I mean, I go. Do you remember when Matt Booz came out with the Room 101, the original Room 101? Yeah. And I was at the trade show. That was a hit of the trade show. Yeah. What came out? What came out was <laughs> was nothing like that. Yeah. So I mean, I'm I'm sure that some of these stealth releases um, are probably cigars that they had in stock that just put they put a band on it, and that's not the actual cigar that's going to be under that band when it gets its real release. So, you know, you may be. You know, you put it on your list, you're like, this is a great cigar, and then, you know, it, maybe it's another cigar from their portfolio already, and then the one that really actually gets released is a new blend. So it, it's tough to do it. Yep. No, so I, 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 I agree, and uh, I, I've given my thoughts on stealth cigars. I won't go down that road, but um, we'll go to another one. Okay, so older line, new Vitola. Do you, do you, is it, it was, yeah. the line was, yeah. Uh, for us, it would be eligible because, we, you know, s- similar to the, w- the way your thought process is, uh, each Vitola is a different blend in our eyes. And especially if it's a new release Vitola, uh, we definitely see it as a new cigar. So, uh, talking about uh, Steve Sock and Silver Mesa. So, Silver Mesa has two new lines for this year, has the, um, the Short Churchill and the um, El Cedros. Um, those would be um, qualifying for, you know, being on the list this year. I, I, that's another area where I eventually evolved with that as well. I didn't do it at first. And, um, again, kind of going to the philosophy of every Vitola is unique. I think it, 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 that I changed it last year to open it up to new Vitolas, um, as well this year. So I thought it was kind of something that I looked at as well. And I think, I think, so I agree with you on that. Yeah. Cause I think some of the uh, more boutique companies, they really utilize the different Vitolas um, to create slightly different blends. Um, I think for more more of the, the macro companies, um, Vitolas are probably closer in flavor um, between the, in the, in the within the line. Um, but I think there's some there's some brands that really do blend differently for each Vitola, and I think that they um, I think they deserve you know their time if it is different. Yeah, and if you even talk to Steve Saka about Sober Mesa, which was a great example, what he did with the Churchill is he basically he, he changed some of the proportions up and he modified the leaf placement. So he know it's the same tobacco components, but um, it was um, you know it, it was a difference. It turned into a different cigar as well. And I think a lot of good blenders are going to blend to the size anyway. Yeah. Yep. Uh, another one, Cuban cigars on the list. Um, for us, we're not, we're not including Cubans. Part of the reason for that is typically when the cigars are released, it takes a while for us in the States to be able to acquire them. 
Um, so for you to actually get a cigar that was a Cuban cigar that was officially released in 2016, they can say that it's been released, but you'll never see them for a while because they may actually not release them or whatever the case may be. So um, we have a hard time in regards to um, the timing of a release versus actually getting it in our hands. So for us, we're just going to exclude it just to kind of keep it simple um, and not really have to try to chase down things and try to get them quickly. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I kind of go back to that. Well, maybe that's another reason not to limit it to one year. Uh, but it's right. The, the, they tend to release the Cubans late in the year. Mm-hmm. In fact, when I went to Cuba, it was in, it was in August. And I couldn't find anything from all that <laughs> stuff was pretty much gone. Because, you know, all the stuff, the limited stuff they released was gone. So yeah. I couldn't get any. It was like the worst time to go down there with it. But uh, it was nonetheless still, in, you know, it was still still fun. Um you know, you know, Kate, Casey, uh, Casey's actually in our chat room and he says maybe a separate list for rare and limited. I kind of am really leaning towards that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I kind of really, I do like that idea a lot. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how this is going to, it's going to change. I think it's going to change how a lot of us are doing the cigar of the year list. Um, you know, I, I'll say this. I, and you, are you guys doing a list this year? We are. It's become, I get more negative on the list now than positive. <laughs> Yeah. So I guess I'm doing something right. I get more negative. And yeah. you know what? I think it's a, I, again, I guess I'm doing something right if I'm getting it. I like being challenged on that. So mm-hmm. I do get more negative on that. Yeah, I like uh, one of the big things I like about the list is getting all the feedback um, because it spurs cigar discussion. So, you know, we're obviously doing the list based on our palates. And, um, you know, we, June and I do the reviews in our, you know, for our palettes, and we're trying to share that for people that have similar palettes to us. Obviously, we're not going to be able to give great advice to somebody that has a completely different palette than us. So I think people have to kind of keep that in mind. It's, it, it's, it's a report on the person's palette on how they're rating and ranking the cigars. So they have to keep that in mind. But I always like the discussion that happens because they say, oh, you listed this number three, but, you know, this would be, you know, way down on my list or wouldn't even make a list for me. But I just like those discussions. I think that that, you know, anything, any kind of discussion around cigars is positive. Like, you know, Phil's talking about, keep it positive. Um, You know, as long as you're not, you know, you know, disparaging people's list and saying they don't have a good palate, things like that, you know, it's, it, people can't be wrong with their list. You know, they, they're just giving their opinion on, on what they taste and things like that. So, um, they, people just have to take that into consideration, but I'm always welcome to, um, discussion on it. I, I enjoy it. Yeah. Paul and I do separate lists and I think it works for what we do. And part of the reason why I've kept them separate, we've kept them separate is because we're in different regions and, it's not that the some cigars have a better distribution in the Northeast and in the Southeast is what we found. Right. Plus, it gives the two points of view. So yep. when Paul and I we do the, we record our short segments, it kind of it spurns that discussion a lot. Uh, and plus, Coop was always it was kind of always done a little different anyway. So and I can tell you that I'm not going to give away what my number one is. The, the list is just about done. Uh, Paul's not going to agree with my number one, and I'm not sure if he spoke my number two. So. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that'll yeah. happen. And yeah. yeah, we're doing we're doing it similar. We're doing two separate lists. We're not doing a, a combined list or anything like that. It just, I think it takes away from uh, each of our palettes if you just kind of say, "All right, we're gonna rate our lists and we'll you know somehow somehow kind of average them together, and then that'll generate the list." I think that kind of takes away from what it is. So, um, you know, we you know when we as we do our reviews and you know individually. Um, in the same review, we want to kind of keep that format going forward so people can, you know, look at somebody's list and say that's their palette so I can go by on their list or I can go on the other list or whatever they want to do. So that's why we're keeping it separate similar to how you're doing it. Yep. I got one more question in this. In this, It was kind of rapid fire, but, but it's good discussion too. Uh, c- cigar sales, the, sale, the amount of sales on a cigar, should that factor into the cigar of the year? Mm, it depends on how you want to do it, I think. I know that uh, Dave Garofalo does it that way. Um, they take sales into account uh, for Cigar Authority. Um, I think that's fine if you want to if if you want to do that for your criteria. Um, for me, it doesn't matter. Um, we're really focused on flavor, so um, you know there are certain brands that they may sell more because they have better sales team or they have better distribution or whatever it is. I don't think that for me, I don't think that really should matter on on how well the cigar rates. Yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> 
I, I do think it's an, I think it's kind of a component, a small component, right? So if I see, for example, like new AJ Fernandez's New World, if it's close with another cigar, and I see New World was really taken off, I'm probably going to give it as a tiebreaker to New World. My my my, my issue with the, with the cigar authorities list, and I, and I do love Dave, and I love what he does, but it's too much tied to. I mean, I know he has a website and stuff, but it's too much tied to his store in terms of if he surveyed the 15 big retailers in the country. Right. I think that would be awesome if someone did that. A cabinet yes. survey of the, of the top 15, top 20 retailers. I would love, but the fact it's only they're only basing it on numbers of one. And I'm not sure if a re, I don't know how you do that either, but yeah. um, that's uh, that's 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 how I think that's how you got to make that. And I understand what they're coming. They're retailers, so I kind of get what yep. they're doing. I respect what they're doing. It's 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 an interesting thing to say the least, but that would be the way I would do it if I ever incorporated the sales piece. Yeah, it's a bit regional for them, you know. So cigars that are up there that they get um, definitely get a, a leg up on other cigars. Um, but like you know, like you said, definitely it's good for them as a retailer because um, for one, they really include their um, customers, so um, that really helps the stores. So I, 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 I think, definitely see. I, I think that's a really good thing that they do. Um, it's something you know, Paul and I have looked at possibly some some things for next year about getting more feedback from our audience and that's something we may explore but i do really like that they do that i kind of like the fact that they just pick a number one as opposed to you know i've done the countdown list like casey Kasem. that's my that's been my thing but i kind of like that hey these uh the academy award nominee kind of a like approach is pretty cool too so i kind of like that as well so uh i said no one's i I never say no one's right no one's wrong um it's, it's a lot of fun in the end yeah, if you start taking, uh, you know, listeners or viewers' opinions, don't let it turn into the all-star balloting. I mean, that just turns into a popularity contest. So I would say do separate lists, do a kind of a, a listener viewers list, and then kind of do your own list and just keep them separate. Otherwise, I think you know things get lost into popularity contests and stuff like that. Yeah, no, I I agree. I mean, we challenge we challenge all the time. You know, sponsors versus non-sponsors, cigar fish, and I always right. challenge on that. I don't know how you solve that problem. We we have to have sponsors to stay in business, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and I'll tell you, I think it's, uh, there's got to be some that are going to be more upset than others. It's just it's it, for everyone who says oh, you, I gave that number to a sponsor. What they're not hearing is the phone call or email I'm getting from the other from the sponsor. sponsor. So, yeah, exactly. so I mean, <laughs> but we love all of our sponsors on the Stow Geeks and thank them all. Yep, yep. Uh, and, so and, got, anything got, else you want to add on that? Uh, this topic? Yeah, I got a, I got another idea that I, I toyed around with in the past and I, we haven't pulled the trigger on it. And I don't know that we will just because of how FDA may work out. But um, the thought of doing a, instead of doing a calendar year for a cigar of the year is if you created a cigar season and you define what the time frame is, I know you do it where it's kind of, uh, right after Thanksgiving to right before Thanksgiving. That's kind of how right. your time frame is, right? So right. in for non-Cubans, the bulk of the releases come out around IPCPR, which is in July. So if you set the time frame, something like, you know, beginning of May or beginning of June, start that start the clock then um, because you're going to get your flood of releases then. That gives you more time to get smoke through those cigars that get released. And then, you you know, the ones that get delayed, like how Steve Saka did with the, the Sober Mesa, where it kind of, it was announced in July. It was set to come out, supposed to be October, November, and it kind of got pushed to, like, late November. Um, that would, you'd hit that kind of in the, still in the first half or right at the middle point of that cigar season. And you'd still be able to include those. Now, you're still going to have those issues where, you know, maybe a cigar comes out, you know, middle of May or something like that. So you're still close to getting to the end. But the number of releases typically at that time of year is far reduced from what you get in July and August kind of thing. So, um, you know, if you set up a something like that where you had a season, you still use 12 months to do it. But you have, you know, kind of, you just, Move. You just slide the time frame a little bit, and it gives you the bulk of the cigars up front. It may give you a little bit more time to get, you know, a lot of those cigars smoked, which I think is a challenge for most of us because, you know, you have end of July with a lot of them coming out, and you have to get through all those um, kind of in that, you know, five to six month window to get that list put together. So it just gives you a little more time frame to get through the bulk of the cigars. 
be, I had that problem. I had to delay my my start. Normally it was a December first to thirty first, um, but I had to delay it because I smoked through the whole list again, and I did not complete that process. And my whole calendar, because the IPCPR coverage was longer, um, it, it and, I, and cigar coops kind of really planned out for in quarters, so. It really just, I just said, you know what, I'm not going to force this through. Uh, I I have to kind of, I have to account if I get sick or something like that. So I just said, I'm just going to play it safe. And I I know I can commit to a start date for people will be looking for. So it's going to start December 9th, uh, which is next Friday. Uh, I'll start unveiling mine. And uh, I know Cigar Fishing Now is the week after, and we'll see a lot of folks get in there. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're not going to post our list until uh, beginning of January. Um, just because, you know, we want to get through the full year and get as many cigars reviewed up on the site. Because that's the other criteria for us is going to be, has to be reviewed on the site, similar to how you do it. Um, it's just not going to be something that we just smoked, you know, randomly on the side. Um, we want to be able to have um, backing behind why we're putting something on the list. Are your, is your list going to be solely based on the, the develop and palette score? Or do you factor in intangibles for that? It's going to be completely on the score. And then okay. if there's any if there's any ties in score, it's going to be up to the reviewer to be able to um, s- set the set the ranking for any ties. So that'll be the only time there's really something that um, there's a little bit of a feeling that the person has to be able to change the the rankings. Now, you said you do re-smoke the cigars, or you don't? Yeah, typically we'll smoke them uh, multiple times, um, but we'll use it. We're going to use what we use as a review score for the rating. Okay. The, yeah. the, the the smoking after the fact may be just to to, to break a tie or something like that. Yeah, so I, I've uh, w- when I re-smoke it, there's another score that kind of goes, and I, I compare it. Now, if the score is way off, I try to smoke another one after that to see. Now, I've had some cigars rock it up. Uh, so it's like I whittle it down to about 40 cigars and pick the 30. Um, but I've had some rock it up, and I've had some like – I've had a, I, one year I had a 94 – I'm not going to name it so I completely fizzle out. <laughs> That's all yeah. I'll say. It, it happened one year. So, um, and again, I thought, you know, again, you could sometimes get a batch that was really good or really bad. So I kind of, that's the reason why I do it. Um, but yeah, then I use some tiebreakers are some in general, what, if, if I do know the cigar sold very, very well, mm-hmm. um, you know, again, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to give the Academy Award to someone who has, that's going back to sales. But I get it, too, that if the cigar is in a lot of people's hands and they're enjoying it, that should – so it's kind of an intangible tie-breaking factor is what I'll use with that. Yeah. And, that, I mean, that may play into – you know, if we try to break a tie, that may play into it. It's really just going to be feeling at that point is to say, you know, you have two cigars that have the exact same score. Which one goes above the other one? And it's really just going to be personal opinion that not how we do it. Yeah, I mean, there was another interesting scenario I had this year. Uh, I smoked the Davidoff Royal release, mm-hmm. and it got a 93. Right. Um, and by all in all years, a 93 is is a score. That, if you're 93, you're, guar- you're pretty much guaranteed you're going to make it. Um, for most part, I said sometimes something will drop, but um, it was because it was an eighty dollar cigar. Mm-hmm. I only gave the the try one Stogie Geeks rating, and it's got to be a box worthy cigar to make the list. So it oh, did. Okay. It did. So it did, it's not going to make it. Um, not it'll probably an honorable mention, but I, yeah, I could because it was not good. Enough, it wasn't good enough to say go spend eight hundred dollars on a box of cigar. I couldn't say it. Right. So, but it was a hell of a cigar. I, I can't knock that either. So that that's kind of where I looked at that. I don't know how many they're selling it at either. So that's yeah. kind of what have, that. So the Stogie Geeks rating kind of factors in a little with that too. Yeah, I think people just have to be aware of what people's criteria are for creating those lists. I mean, um, not all lists are created equal, so you can't really compare one list to the other and say these should match up. I mean, it's really if you say, like, just like you said, um, if the price point's too high and you can't recommend a box buy on it, then that's not going to be on your list. But um, if you were just going directly based on the score, it would be on the list. So as people, you need to read, read the fine print, and usually most sites post what the criteria is. And if they don't, ask them. I mean, I do that whenever I have a question is just ask, find out what, you know, what goes into making that list so that you have an, a clear understanding of, of how the ranking works. Um, because, you know, I like to compare lists as well, um, but I want to be able to n- know what I need to take into account to be able to make that comparison. 
Yeah, there's, I, I love looking at the various lists. The one thing that will make lose me, you'll lose me right away, is when you say I like the guy. Well, yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> but I'm, that's, I mean, that's I'm sorry. That, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, it's not that I, I dislike the review, but you know, I, there are manufacturers I love, but this is unfortunately this is probably like I said, it's an exercise that pisses a lot more. So I have 244 cigars that were reviewed this year. Right. Only 30 are gonna make it. So. There's like 214 cigars by X number of manufacturers. They're going to be pissed off at me is the way I look at it. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, I think uh, we covered everything there. So Mm -hmm. what we could do is uh, we'll take a break and come back with our Stogies of the Week segment. So stay tuned. 